Okay, everybody back. Um, we'll get started with the common patient objections to home uh, modalities. Back to you, Richard. All right, thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, so common patient objections to home. So, I mean, we talked about the why with the ETC models, and we've talked about the basics of, of home hemo and PD. Um, and now we're going to talk about, you know, how do we get the patients to, to do this, right? I mean, this is one of the biggest challenges that I hear all the time from, from people is, is, you know, a lot of times we assume like our, our, our big providers, the LDOs, they'll give these, these objectives and they'll put out these corporate initiatives to say, we're going to get more patients home, but then they don't really give you any training on, on how to have that conversation, right? I think they assume a lot of times that we know how to talk about these things. And, and, and the reality is, is, is we go to nursing school and not, not, not communications. I mean, a lot of our, our nursing does, you know, talks about assessments and, and education, but we don't talk about how to, how to have a conversation with the patient about um, doing what's best for them or what's, what may be right for them. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at, um, at, going into the next slide, we'll be looking at, at some of the common patient objectives, and, and I've kind of listed them out here. And what you hear, a lot of times you'll see, okay, so cannulation, you know, and I know this is going to be, I'm going to say this for, just for Sam, because I know he loves to hear it, is um, we don't like using the term stick, right? I know to, to, to borrow from Sam, the stick is a prison term. <laughs> I mean, it, you get, you get stuck in a prison. You don't, you get shanked in a prison. You don't, you don't get stuck in a dialysis center. You get cannulated. Um, so cannulation is, is one of the things where patients will say, I'm scared of needles. Um, so uh, you'll also hear about safety. Um, is it safe to, to do at home, you know, is, is doing my dialysis treatment safe to do at home? Um, those are that, you know, safety is, is something that, that is always on the patient's mind and thinking about like, you know, I want to make sure that when I do my treatments, I can do my treatment and, and, and complete my treatment safely. Um, frequency, we talked a little bit about this before, you know, um, do I really need to do five days or more per week when I'm doing my treatments? Uh, you talk about care partner scenarios. Um, it's too much for my family. Um, and a lot of times patients will say that without ever talking to their family um, and not really understanding exactly what, you know, what an impact their, their disease has on, on their family. Um, I know that was something my dad never really talked about. He never had that conversation to ask us how it, 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 it impacted us. And so it's something I like to introduce all the time. Um, and of course, community. I know a while back there, I don't know if you guys remember this, but there was a, a piece that um, uh, John Oliver did on, on his show on HBO talking about how um, he didn't really believe that patients would actually say, I, I don't want a transplant or I don't, I don't want to do a home dialysis because I'm going to miss all of my dialysis friends. And, and, you know, as much as he may not have believed it, it, it it's, it's very real. Um, it's, it's something I hear all the time. Uh, well, I like coming here. This is the only real outlet I have um, because if I'm at home, I'm just home and I, nobody, I don't have any friends at home or I don't belong to any groups. I just kind of sit at home and watch TV. Um, but when I come to dialysis, I, I talk to people. Um, I see people I, 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 you know, on a regular basis. I become friends with these people. So it's something that's very real and, and we have to know how to, how to have that conversation. Um, so on the next slide, um, you'll see uh, some appropriate responses uh, to patient objections. So, and, and these aren't the only responses, but these are just a few suggestions that I make um, when patients say, I'm scared of needles. Um, so I always try to validate that, that fear by saying this is a normal response. Nobody, nobody really um, has, is born with a needle in, in, in their arm or in their leg or wherever it has to go. You're, you're not born with that. So it's not something that's going to be completely 100% comfortable for, for most people. Um, it's, it's a foreign body in, entering into your, your, your arm. Um, I mean, that's the reality of what it is. So it's a normal response. So it's important to, to acknowledge the patient's uh, fear and sometimes even the care partner's fear because the care partner is also going to have some, some hesitation if they're the ones that are having to cannulate their patient. So, um, I mean, sometimes it's, it's something that, that you have to acknowledge, make it normal, and then, and then um, 
you know, proceed from there with, with a mindset for education and understanding that, that this is something that those patients are, and partners are gonna have to overcome. Um, letting the patient know you're gonna have more control over it if you do it yourself. Um, one of our friends, uh, uh, his, na his, uh, his name, uh, Harvey Wells, uh, is, is a patient advocate as well. I, and if you can't tell, I work with a, with a lot of patient advocates. Um, but uh, Harvey was, is a retired patient advocate who used to say, you know, there was no way in hell I was putting that needle in my arm. And a nurse told him, well, there's no way in hell you're getting on the machine until you do. <laughs> um, so they put him in a situation where he was forced to do it. Um, he did it the first time and his, his experience was that once he did it, he said, I would never let another person touch my access again because it was so different for him. Having that control to, to put it in and to feel where the needle was and to feel like if it was uncomfortable, he could stop. Yeah, um, most of the time when he went, he's like you said, when I went into the center, those technicians, they walked up, they put that needle in. If it hurt, it was too bad. It was too late. It was already done. There was nothing I could do about it. But when I had in my hand, if it hurt, it didn't feel right. It didn't feel comfortable. I could stop. I could reposition. I could pull it out. I could start over again. I could take my time. Um, and then when you have that kind of control, it becomes a lot less scary. Um, no one will care for your access like you or your partner. And, and, and that's just not to say that our, our in-center teams don't, like I said before, they don't, not that they don't care. It's just that if you think about it from an in-center perspective, I've been a PCT, so I know how this goes. Um, you know, you're, you're assigned four, four patients every shift, um, sometimes more. And you have only a limited amount of time to, to do everything that you need to do um, before you have to move on to your next patient or you're behind. And so there's always a little bit of a rush and, you know, in, in, in a haste to rush and get things done and follow a schedule, sometimes things get overlooked or sometimes mistakes get made. And, and when you're a patient or a care partner caring for your own access, you don't have that need to rush. You can take your time. You can, you can focus on, um, you know, doing everything by the book, check your boxes and, and follow the instructions that we provide you just like it, we, the, you know, you're trained just like the patient care technicians on the floor are trained. Um, and, and you're able to actually, you know, control that situation. Um, is it safe to do treatments at home by ourselves? Um, so, you know, one of the things that I always explain when we talk about PD or HHD is that these treatments are, are way more gentle than in center. Okay, so this is applicable to both PD and HHD. Um, and I usually explain, so like with PD, it's a very slow process of removing the fluid. You have a longer period of time to remove the fluid, which has less impact on your heart. Um, that fluid exchange is done in a way more gentle uh, way so that when you're removing the contaminants or those, those toxins from your system, um, it's not as hard on, on your body. Um, and in HHD, you know, our dialysate flow rates on, a, on an HHD machine are usually one third of our blood flow rate, which means that dialysate flow rates generally run less than 200 mLs per minute. When in in-center, we are talking about running, you know, six to 800, five to 800 dialysate flow rates on a normal basis, where this can have a, a really negative effect on the patient um, in, in what we call myocardial stunning, right? And what happens in that, in that process is basically patients in center are put into shock almost on a regular basis. Um, and our treatments at home are much more gentle than that. Not to mention if we do more frequent therapy, you're gonna have less fluid to take off. So that means that your UF rates are gonna be lower, which means there's less likelihood of you cramping or having uh, low blood pressure, hypotensive episodes. All of those things uh, become um, less common and, and not to say that they won't ever happen, but they're a lot more less, uh, a lot more, uh, uh, less invasive, they're, it's it's less invasive, it's less of, impactful on your body, and they're easier to manage when they do happen because it's not as extreme. And and really, I mean, you, what you're hearing me say right now is the conversation I have with the patient. So when you're having these conversations with the patient, it's always important to assess where they are, you know, and that could be that could mean you know education level, it could mean emotional state, it could mean um, you know, just mental, mental capacity. It can mean a lot of different things, but you really have to know where that patient is and be able to get to them at their level and help them understand like 
how that works. Like I may not say hypotensive episode to a patient who has less than a high school education. I may say to them, hey, you know, you know, you, you have low blood pressure in, in your in-center treatment. You know, when you do more frequent therapy and we take off the fluid a lot slower over more days, you know, you're not going to have low blood pressure. That, that low blood pressure will be a lot less likely or you may not cramp as much. So you really have to get to them where they are. Um, you'll receive an extensive training from, from your nurses. I make that point. You're not going to go home until we're ready for you to go home, until we think you're ready to go home. We're not going to put you in an unsafe situation. We're going to make sure that you've, you've shown that you can manage the machine, you can manage the complications, you know what to do in an emergency. All of those boxes will be checked before you're ever allowed to go home. Oh, and by the way, we're going to go home with you for the first couple of treatments to make sure that you're, you're safe before we let you uh, off. And then even then, we're still going to check in with you routinely. I always recommend um, when you send a patient home, we always make sure they understand, like, I'm going to call you probably two or three times a week for that first week, that first two weeks that you're home to make sure everything goes okay. Um, you're going to always have that tether to our, to our program so that you can make sure that if there's anything you need, we can step in and help um, as soon as possible. Um, and then we kind of ensure also the equipment is, is devised to safely treat patients at home. There's so many safety systems involved in all of these different systems that we use um, to make sure that the patient is safe. I know that we talk about things like nocturnal and solo patients as well. Um, there's devices that we use for venous leak detection to make sure that patients are not put in a compromised situation, that it gives them the ability to notif notify them when these situations are coming are, are happening. And they're given the, uh, the training to learn how to troubleshoot these problems or how to you know, get themselves out of these situations immediately just by ending treatment and, and contacting their, their uh, home program or a physician, or even just going to the ER, just like they would if they were an in-center patient. Um, to look at the next slide here, um, we'll talk about, do I really need five times per week or more, and, and, or seven times a week when you're dealing with PD? Um, your treatments will be shorter than you are used to in center with HHD. So that's one thing I always tell them is that most of the times, most of the time, I mean, and this is making a claim, but I can tell you it's very rare that I've seen a patient do a longer treatment unless they're doing nocturnal. Um, and then and nocturnal is specific by design. So um, I think that's important to, to make sure patients understand is that, you know, we're, we're not really asking them to do more dialysis. We're, we're asking them to spread it out over a period of five days versus doing it all in three days. Um, and I think the other piece to this is when we when we talk about time uh, related to, to, to patients in center, um, a lot of times the patients are only thinking about the time they spend on the machine. Um, they're not considering the amount of time it takes them to get to a clinic. In some cases that can be depending on environment and where you live and your, your surroundings. I mean, if you're in LA, um, it could take you 30 minutes to go five miles. I mean, so um, you spend that an hour a day traveling, just going to and from dialysis. Um, and then considering how much time do you sit waiting for your chair when you're in the center? Um, and then once you're on the machine and, and how, you know, if the things get busy and your treatment is done, sometimes they can't take you off right away. So you have to sit there for a few minutes and wait for them to be able to come to get to you. And then once they take you off, you have to hold your sight. So then you're sitting there you know, for a while holding your sights while, while uh, you know, they're setting up for the next patient. Um, and so all of those things are, are not always considered or transportation, you know, maybe sometimes if you're on transportation, the van doesn't show up on time or they don't show up at all um, or they don't pick you up on time or pick you up, you know, or they get sidetracked or something happens, a van breaks down. A lot of different considerations there in time that are not present in the home setting. So those are things that I like to compare uh, when, when talking to a patient. Um, five treatments can help you have more energy and better outcomes or more treatments, more frequent therapy can help you have more energy and better outcomes. That's something that's important to, to really um, hit home with them because I always have that conversation with my in-center patients when I'm talking about home is how do you feel when you get off a of treatment? Most of the time they say, oh, I feel okay. You know, I have to go home and take a nap and it takes me a while to get back to normal. Um, but when I tell them, you know, if you were doing more frequent therapy, um, you know, your recovery time would be reduced to less than 30 minutes. And what a lot of people don't understand about recovery time is there are studies out there that show that um, 
for every hour you spend in recovery is a 5% uh, increase in risk for adverse occurrence. And so it's important to, to kind of emphasize that with them is like the, long, the longer you're, ta- you're, you're in recovery, the, the less likely you are to feel good. Um, patients who dialyze more frequently transplant at a higher rate. We've, we've talked about that in other parts of the presentation. A lot of our patients, their primary goal is to get to transplant. So if we are talking about home as a means to increasing the incidence of transplant, um, that's going to help a lot of these patients make that decision. I've seen patients that are sitting on the fence, just kind of like, I don't know, I'm not real sure. Well, you know, have that transplant conversation because if it makes them a better candidate, uh, a lot of times they'll 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 be interested. Um, patients who dialyze more frequently have better survival rates, and we've seen that multiple times through the presentations that we've seen today. Um, the, the different slides I've shown you guys today is that we know that home patients have better survival rates. And if their, their goal is to stay alive long enough to get that transplant, then, then they should be doing a home modality, not an in-center modality to start. Um, so this is too much of a commitment for my family. Um, I, 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 living, having lived that life, um, I could totally relate. And this is the conversation that I would have with them is discuss the ability to take ownership of their own disease process. That was something that, you know, I learned the hard way my dad couldn't do. Um, he, he, or, or didn't want to do, he was, he was conditioned and trained to have everybody take care of him, um, which is, in, you know, he was the first HHD patient I ever worked with. So I learned a lot there. Um, and, and what I learned from that process was that it's important to, to tell the patient how much they can really own their own disease process and they can, they can have control over their own outcomes by being a home patient. Um, it gives them the opportunity to, to really be responsible for doing dialysis. You're not going to have excuses. You won't be able to put it on anyone else. You'll be able to take ownership of it um, and having control. And a lot of patients, that's all they want is control. I mean, we, we talk about these difficult patients like Sam was talking about who come in and tell us what to do when we're in center. Um, and, and you think it's, it's, a, it's that, that ongoing battle for control over their own lives. And, and if you give it to them, a lot of these patients will, will, will take it with, you know, gladly and, and really do well. Um, discuss the ability to specifically define the role of the partner. This is where we say a lot of times, you know, the commitment for the family is, is an assumption that, oh, my partner is not going to, you know, this is going to be too much for my partner. Um, when you can really say, okay, what is it that, the, that you can do for yourself? And what is it that you can't do for yourself? Because anything that you can do for yourself will relieve your partner of having to do that. And then going forward, like only the things that your partner has to do is what they're going to be responsible for. So you really, I mean, while you're worried about it being too much of a commitment for your family, you have control over that as well. Because if you, if, if you do more for yourself, then that's less work your partner has to do. And it makes it less of a burden for your, for your partner. Um, and then calculate, like I said before, calculate the amount of time family spends going to and from the clinic. I think this is something that people m- miss all the time. You know, I used to hear people say, oh, well, I can drop him off and go shopping. And I'm like, yeah, but what if you could take him with you and you could go shopping together and you didn't have to drop him off anywhere? Or what if you could, you know, you could, um, you know, instead of having to, to, to care for a, a patient who comes home from a uh, from dialysis, feeling worn down, tired, and having to watch over them, make sure that they, you know, they're okay, with no real professional support. Um, what if that was only like a 30-minute window, and then and they were ready to go, and they were like, you know, just like normal. Again, I talk about my patient that I just I, I ended with in the last uh, section. Um, it was funny because we were two days into the training. Actually, on the first day, he actually jumped up out of the chair after his first HHD treatment, looked at his wife and, and said, hey, you know, I want to go to a movie. I want to go to lunch. Let's go do something. I have all this energy. I just feel really good. On the first day of home hemo, he said, I, I feel good. I don't want to waste it. I want to go do something. And his wife looked at me and said, what did you guys do with my husband? She's like, I was so afraid coming into home dialysis that I was going to get this worn out, beat up guy five days a week that I was going to have to be worried about and take care of. And I'm not getting that. What I'm getting is a, a, my husband who, who used to, you know, like to do stuff with me, 
um, back. He's 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 that guy again. And she she was like blown away. She's like, this is this is great. Um, so those are those are different ways to present it to talk about this because I think um, a lot of times even the patient doesn't consider how much of an impact their treatment and their illness has on uh, their family. Um, and we'll go into uh, this next slide. It says, I'm going to miss my dialysis friends. You're always welcome to go back and tell them about your new therapy. That's what I tell my patients all the time. I would say to them, you're always welcome to come back and talk to people. Um, people like Sam, Rasheen, Harvey, uh, Harvey Wells, um, my other patient, that these guys are all uh, really become patient advocates to, to talk about their journey and share their experience because I mean, nobody is as credible as someone who has been in their position, right? I think this is, this is where we really get value from our patients coming back and sharing their stories. Um, and, and they're a, a huge benefit to a lot of the home programs all over the country. Um, encourage them to become a patient mentor for a new and, and potential home patient. So I would always say, you know, most of these patients that come from in-center about, I mean, a good, probably close to 90% of our patients come from in-center on home. Uh, uh, home hemo anyway. Um, and so what I would tell them is, you know, all those people that you made friends with, um, you know, become a mentor for them. Tell them about your experience and what you're able to do now and how, how you know, the training went for you and be honest. Um, don't paint it as this pretty picture that it's perfect. Talk about your challenges and your struggles as well as you talk about your successes and, and the benefits because it's important to have that accurate picture. You know, knowing that some of the, the challenges that they come up against in the uh, in the in center world are, are are nowhere near as uh, uh, you know nowhere near what they have in, in the home world. So it's important to to think about that from that perspective, um, and then encourage them to plug into support group. I know um, that, that I think there's a lot of different organizations out there um, right now. It's harder. I know everything's being done more um, virtually and on social media and things like that. Um, but those are good ways to, to spend your time and, and, and really get into, um, you know, ways to, to connect socially, because um, that social change is, is, is it is real. Um, like we said earlier, um, patients do have a lot of um, social outlet when they come to the in-center unit. Um, but my, my goal is, is that, I mean, what did you do before dialysis? How did you make friends before you were on dialysis? Because you know, you didn't start out on dialysis and most patients had friends before they came to dialysis. So, um, you know, I encourage them to get plugged into support groups, find outlets for them to do things that they used to do and they used to love to do so that they could, you know, plug back into that social uh, world that they were in prior to being a dialysis patient. Um, so um, I like to also talk about, again, if I haven't talked about it enough, um, the importance of patient advocates. Um, they're the most credible source of information that we have available to us. I mean, allow the patient to get a real life account of HHD or PD. It doesn't even have to just be HHD, it can be PD as well. I know now uh, in, in, my, in my everyday life, we're using patient advocates for both modalities to, to really help um, patients cross that bridge from, from uh, doubt or, or fear into comfort and, and confidence with, with home modalities. So it's important to make sure that we give them those opportunities with, uh, to in, in engage with our patient advocates. Um, they can relate to every aspect of dialysis, right? Because they've, they've done it, they have to do it. I mean, especially when you have patients like, uh, you know, Rasheen and a few others out there who have done all modalities. I mean, basically have done in-center, PD, home, chemo, and transplant, and so um, those are those are very important um, perspectives for for patients to hear. Um, patient advocates are effective for reassurance when they when they self cannulate. Um, you know, self cannulation is is one of the the hardest things for patients to 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 deal with and to overcome um, that that fear for uh, when they're when they're considering doing a home modality, uh, especially well, with HHD. Um, so it's, it's something that, that, you know, those patient advocates can be really effective in helping uh, facilitate that conversation and, and in encouraging the patient to just, you know, can, to stay vigilant, stay, stay, stay focused and, and really um, help them find ways to overcome that fear. And 
patient advocates also should be properly trained on how to talk to patients. So it's not like you just want to take a patient that you started, you know, a couple of weeks ago and throw them into an advocacy situation. You always want to make sure that they have formal training. And there are a lot of ways for them to do that. I mean, you can, you know, if you're qualified to do that yourself, you're welcome to do that. But um, there are um, organizations and groups out there that provide training on how to um, develop patient advocates and, and really coach them on how to talk to patients in an appropriate and, and respectful way so that they're, um, you know, they're, they're effective and, and, and uh, helpful for a patient population that we're serving. So I wanted to, to give you some sample questions because one of the things that, like we said, people struggle with is, is how to start that conversation with the patient in the in-center unit. So I, when I do lunch and learns at a facility, I usually will, will challenge the staff to say, okay, what, um, after you're done with this lunch and learn and you've, you've received all this information, I'm going to ask you to go out and talk to one patient on the in-center floor about home dialysis. But the challenge is I want you to do it without saying the words home dialysis. Um, because I think when you say home dialysis, um, patients immediately put up a wall in a lot of situations. Um, they, they just don't, when you put that, that, home, that wall up, at that point, they're not hearing anything else after that. So it's like, you know, the common question I get is like, okay, so I, or I, I ask, I say, if, if you had to go out and start that conversation right now, how would you do it before I give them any sample questions? And most of the, most of the people would say, well, has anyone ever talked to you about home dialysis? And I'm like, okay, but that's a yes or no answer. I mean, most of the time they'll say yes. And then if you try to engage conversation, most of them say, yeah, I've already heard about it. I don't wanna hear anymore. Um, I hear that all the time. So my challenge is let's, let's, let's have that conversation in a different way. Um, how does your family deal with your CKD? Again, it's a different perspective. It's about your family. It's not about you at that point. How is your family dealing with, with your chronic kidney disease? Um, you know, what are you missing out on by being part of that, uh, being at dialysis today? Um, you know, a lot of times I found, especially on those patients that were TTS on Saturdays where they're like, oh yeah, there's a family reunion, but I couldn't go because I had to be at dialysis or oh, I had a birthday party, but I didn't go. My family's there, but I'm here at dialysis. Those are all things that you could say, well, what are you missing out on today? And you know that you didn't, you don't have to miss out on it. There's other ways that you could do your treatment so that you don't have to miss out on these things um, and, and, and engage the conversation in that way. Um, if you could feel better after treatment, would you want more information? Um, and a lot of that's really good for patients, especially patients you know are, are struggling with uh, recovery time and things like that. So, I mean, you know, recovery is a, is a big part of it. You know, most patients will say, yeah, I usually don't feel good until the day after dialysis. Um, and that's a long time to wait to, be, to feel better. Um, so it's a, it's a good place to start. Um, you know, again, similar, if you weren't at dialysis, how would you spend your time? Um, I always like to ask this, what's on your bucket list? What are like two or three things that you wanna do before before you walk off of this world, you know? And I think that's, that's a, it's a, it's a fun conversation to have with them. Like I, you always just kind of ask what's on your bucket list. Um, and then they'll usually give you a few things. And what I usually do is say, you know, those sound like they're pretty hard to do with, with in-center dialysis. Have you considered going a, another route in order to make it easier for that? Would, you know, if you, there was a better way, would you want to know more? And, and I never said home dialysis, we're talking, the topic is their, their activities and what they like to do. And then you switch gears on them and then say, okay, if you want more information on how you could maybe make that happen, I can get that for you, you know? Um, what reasons would you have to consider a different type of treatment? And, and let them tell you, you know, what, what do they struggle with? You know, do you work? Do you go to school? Do you have kids? Um, what is it that, that you're struggling with that, that if you had a different type of treatment, you could fit into, you know, your own lifestyle, what would that, what would your reasons be for doing that? Um, and then how does dialysis affect the way you plan your life? I mean, are you living to dialyze? Or are you dialyzing to live? You know, those are the, that's a common question that we ask. Um, but, you know, and, and the way I look at this is if you're working in an in-center unit, um, and from having the experience of working in an in-center unit, you don't just, get your patient in, do their vitals, you know, set up your machine and hook them up and walk away. There's always conversation that happens during that time frame when you're putting that patient on the machine and you're getting them set up to go 
on their treatment, what a perfect time to have these conversations, right? I mean, you're already there. You're going to talk to them anyway. Why not talk to them about something that could change their life? Uh, why not have meaningful? And the, instead of talking about what's on Jerry Springer today or, you know, um, you know, what they had for dinner the night before, let's talk about something that's going to change the, the way the way of life for them. Um, and I think that that can help us be impactful um, in a meaningful way. Um, I know there's there, there's a lot of times we have to talk about techniques for overcoming fears, right? Because we're coaching these patients through get, trying to get them. So the slide basically will tell us, um, you know, take baby steps when you're addressing difficult topics. You know, don't try and, and, and hit them in the face with a hard topic all at one time. You know, it's like saying, you know, you know, survival is, is, is the worst in center than it is at home. You don't want to hit them right, in, right between the eyes or something like that. You want to, you know, take baby steps into that conversation and, and really kind of go into it gently. Um, don't, don't try to just um, dump information because dumping information a lot of times is very overwhelming and, and they, won't, they won't take much out of it when you do that. Um, provide a positive reassuring atmosphere early on. I think that's that's the key is like when we're when we come in with a positive attitude, um, you know that the, you're gonna you're they're gonna be more receptive, right? Um, it's important to to address things positively. I talked about that nurse who the doctor called out um, at that dinner where she said, you know, where the doctor told her, you know, try to take your clinician bias out of it. If you think it, you know, just because you think that 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 this is the case doesn't necessarily mean that that's what's gonna happen. Um, so take that bias out and really have an open conversation, open-minded conversation uh, with your patients. Um, ensure that time is not an issue when you're attempting new concepts. So these things, like attempting these conversations, you want to make sure that you're not doing it in the last five minutes of your shift before you're walking out of the room because you may find that you need to spend 30 to 45 minutes, maybe even an hour talking to a patient. Sometimes you may not have that hour all the time and it may not be something you do, but it's always good to drop a seed, but if you can find time where you can take that time to be, you know, say during turnover, say, hey, I'm going to come back during turnover and let's let's have more conversation about this. You know, give yourself an opportunity to come back to it and 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 set out that time because I know we get in a rush in center. I know, and especially in this environment, I know how how time consuming things are and how we're short staffed and we're doing all this. Um, but changing lives, it, it takes time, and. and and when you have an appropriate uh, or an important conversation to have, it's always important to try to make sure you have the appropriate amount of time to, to do that. Um, utilize your patient advocates. I can't say that enough to ensure that to assure that patients, uh, the patient, they, they can succeed uh, with the support of a patient advocate. Um, you want to remind patients that every mistake is a learning opportunity. So that's one of the things that I always kind of felt really, really strongly about was is that um, uh, we could we could make sure that um, that that the you know we we gave the patients an opportunity to make to make uh, mistakes. Uh, transitional care units, a patient. Uh, uh, this is a patient centric approach. So transitional programs. I mean, I'll talk briefly about this because the, the transitional programs are not everywhere. But a patient centric approach to gently easing patients into dialysis. A gentler therapy than three times a week in center hemodialysis as more frequent therapy offers less stress. Um, education, they offer education on dialysis modality options in a transitional program. And these are all done in an in-center, so an in-center environment where they can, they can see the patients on the regular traditional in-center um, while receiving more frequent therapy and more education. It helps stabilize the patient when they're first new to dialysis and then uh, helping them get education. So this is something, another way of, of doing that. Um, I would, uh, I'll go into, um, uh, let's see, our experience, the difference type programs where I don't know if we can go to the next slide, Mike. Um, you think experience the difference programs where this offers the hemo patient the opportunity to try uh, daily therapy in, your, in their own center for one to two weeks without giving up their current chair. Um, it's basically a test drive for the patient to try home dialysis. Um, and it'll allow them to kind of um, see the impact on um, more frequent therapy on them before they make a complete commitment to go into training. Um, you can go ahead and skip to the next slide, Mike. Um, in the interest of time, like I said, this is just kind of a thing of how the program works. Uh, they, get, they get basically a test run 
uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm just going to kind of do this really quickly here just to make sure that we have enough time for everyone to ask questions, but this is the test drive version of, of home dialysis. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Now we've talked a lot about, um, again, again, the clinical benefits. And so this is it, less, less stress on the heart, fewer medications for blood pressure control, um, more frequent, uh, more, more likely to survive a kidney transplant with more frequent therapy, uh, and an improved post-dialysis recovery time. Um, next slide. Uh, we can look at the next slide. It'll be uh, increased energy and vitality. Again, this is a big one, improved sexual function. Uh, I can't, I, I mean, I have a whole lot of stories about patients that, you know, um, it's a big deal for a lot of patients uh, that they don't, that this is something that we don't talk about very often or isn't a comfortable conversation. But I know I had a patient once where um, I did 30 minutes of data dumping on him about why he should want to do uh, home hemo. And then the last topic I covered was improved sexual function. And he looked at me and said, if you had just said this in the first five minutes, I would have been sold. You could have saved yourself 25 minutes. Um, so it's something to, to kind of think about and remember um, that that motivation for patients to go home is always different. And you always want to consider what their motivation is. Um, on self-care and cannulation, I know we talked about this, but um, this is a good space to talk about in the in-center programs. Um, HHD training process involves self-cannulation, self-care. Um, it's always a good idea if you can get them started doing self-care um, in the in-center facility before they go to a one-on-one -on -one training situation with the home hemo program or a PD, or, or, well, specifically home hemo for cannulation. Um, and I know this slide says for sticking, which I don't like that. I, I have to change that, um, but um, it's a cannulation for helping patients be, be more savvy with that. Um, let's go ahead and go down. Um, and again, there's Na National Kidney Foundation quality group reports. There's growing evidence that buttonhole cannulation may be less likely to infiltrate. I know there's a lot of conflicting opinions out there about buttonhole, but the reality is, is it's a lot less painful for patients. Um, it helps preserve the integrity of the outflow of the vein and may be easier for patients to self-cannulate. The only caveat I would say about self-care, about buttonhole, is that um, training is everything. Um, you, the pay, anybody teaching buttonhole and, and for any patient uh, performing a buttonhole cannulation or same site cannulation um, should be properly trained to follow all of the steps um, because that's the difference on whether or not the, the patient will be able to, will, will cause problems for their access with infection or infiltration or even st uh, stenosis or, or any of those other complications that may come up. It's, tr it's always about the training. Um, the fact is, is that patients on home with buttonhole cannulation have always reported better results than those in center. And a lot of times I think it's because, you know, patients take care of the same access all the time versus like in center where you have different technicians and nurses taking care of different accesses uh, uh, on a daily basis. So it, it, it could impact uh, the difference there. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so um, self-care, self-cannulation, but in part of the HHD process, it's always uh, better to make sure that you consider the location of the needle. It's like real estate. It's always about location, 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 right? Um, and then there are such things that can aid as, as such as like numbing cream or, or techniques for sticking uh, or help or for cannulating or helping more patients become comfortable with self-cannulation. So I got to update these slides because Sam changed my perspective. And, haven't really updated that slide yet. Um, group training, um, another thing that, that's helpful. I mean, I know none of us learn, I mean, well, probably most of us learned in a classroom setting versus one-on-one. -on -one. So when we take patients home and we wanna teach them, uh, group pr programs are really effective. Um, it's, it's good for the staffing crunch that we're in right now um, because, I, you know, like we said, four to six patients training at the same time versus one-on-one. -on -one. Um, not only is it you're able to train once and teach twice or teach four times, but you're also able to create an environment that patients feel like they're not alone. Um, you know, some of the challenges that some patients go through, they can see they're common among others. Um, 
And so it's important, and this can be done in different settings. You can, you can do self-care training on the in-center floor. You can do versions of this with PD in, in an education room and do uh, you know, the actual exchanges in, in training rooms, but do the, the classroom part in an education room or in your home training rooms. Uh, I know there are some facilities out there that have the ability to train more than one patient at a time. Um, and, and it puts less burden on the staff and patients and care partners build camaraderie and have tons of fun while learning. So something else to think of. Um, the group training again, uh, you know, start date. I always want to make sure you have your, your, your plan in place. And that's just an example of what things to consider um, with, with planning your training. Uh, on the next slide, you, you're always going to want to make sure you have a developed training plan, which a lot of the vendors will provide you with. Um, you don't have to create your own tools. These are all vendors provide a lot of tools for you out there. So it's a good idea to take advantage of those tools. Um, and then uh, it's a pretty flower. <laughs> um, and then have a follow-up plan when you're doing group trainings. So make sure that when you do the, the your, your, your trainings, you have a plan to follow up with these patients. You don't want them to feel like they're on an island and once they leave the home training program, um, you want to make sure that you have time with them and spend, uh, or, you know, to check in and, and make sure that they're doing well. Um, and don't wait for clinic visits. I would do this, like I said earlier, I would call them in the first week, two or three times to make sure that they're doing well, and then uh, kind of wean them off of that schedule. Maybe go after a couple of weeks, take it to once a week. And then after that, maybe once every other week. And then after that, once a month until you're, you know, till they're, they know that they, uh, they're connected. Um, I, on this next slide, I'd like to kind of just like get close to, I know we're getting close to the end here. So um, the next slide, I would like to just kind of emphasize that patients should review all the following information carefully and discuss it with the doctors, decide whether home hemodialysis with next stage or any system is right for them. So just make sure users um, should weigh the risks of benefits of performing home dialysis with all home systems and certain forms of home dialysis have additional risks. So um, with that, um, I, have, I have a quote for you guys um, that I wanted to share. So before we get into questions, just to throw this out there, uh, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. Um, and that's a quote from Benjamin Franklin. And I, I feel like if we take this approach with all of our patients, um, you involve them and they will learn. And so that's something I wanted to leave you with. And with that, Mike, I can uh, pass it over to you and open up for questions. Sorry about the last uh, the last couple slides, guys. I got messed up on the controls here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the screen xed out <laughs> xed out on me. Um, but Richard, thank you so much for for the time for the uh, the extra work you put into this uh, presentation. I know that um, in a lot of presentations that I've seen in the past, and and something that we're we're trying to do through these monthly events is is give enough time to the topic to where we can deep dive it. And, and really walk away with um, you know, the skills that we need to, to impact the patient care, um, to impact the evangelism of uh, whatever topic it might be. In this case, I think evangelism is a great, uh, is a great word for us to leave with that you know, if we're gonna have an impact on that less than 2% HHD and that you know, less than 11% PD population, that this, this needs to move way upstream on the side of education, um, into nursing programs, into uh, technician programs, into CNA programs, into LVN programs, et cetera, so that these people in their training, um, as you said, with the fistula first, catheter last, have that mindset that it's, it's home first and clinic last, um, and, you know, as the last resort or the patient's choice on full informed consent, um, which I think we can all agree for those of us who have been in the industry for any time, that um, whether it be the, the full in informed consent is not delivered or the full plan of care options are, are not delivered, or it's just not the right timing and the right presence of mind for the patient to actually absorb that information or whether it was not repeated enough. So I think it's, it really needs to move upstream 
we on this call can be those evangelists to carry it up into these programs and into our programs, uh, share what we've learned with our colleagues and, and, and watch the needle move, guys. Um, so I'll turn it over to you guys. Are there any questions for Richard or a discussion among each other? I know we've got people from all across the country and even uh, from the UK on this call. With that, um, I'll point you to the chat again and um, hope that you guys will continue to follow our events. Uh, we will be uh, putting together and, and putting out our next event for next month um, shortly. We'll send you guys a follow-up email to this to, to make sure that you have access to that as well as um, to the recordings of this presentation so that you can uh, carry the knowledge base on. Uh, for those hey, Michael, you... that, Michael, this is Heather. Um, just a comment. Richard, sure. I really loved that you brought in the idea of asking the patient um, what, you know, what are, what are two or three goals that you have, you know, for, um, you know, for your, for your well-being or what you want to, you know, you're, you're basically you know, what are your goals in life type of situation, because goals to patients would be totally different from what we as clinical staff think about. Um, you know, it might be that one person just wants to get to September of next year because my son, my grandson is graduating from college or, you know, or, or someone is interested in, you know, going to you know, going uh, out and, and seeing the world and doing travel like and cruises like that patient that patient advocate did. So I, I've actually implement I did implement that at some point. You know, with you know asking patients and and included the social work team on on actually actually asking that question. What are your two or three goals, or what are the two three three things that come to, that are very important to you going forward? Um, and it, de it definitely creates a different dynamic with the patient and the caregiver. Well, thank you for doing that too, because I think that's one of our biggest challenges is I talk to a lot of educators and different, different, they have different titles across the different providers out there, right? They're, whether they're kidney smart or, or KCAs, kidney care advocates and things of those natures. What I've learned is that a lot of them don't ask those kind of questions. You know, they they have a, a list that they want to check the box on, and they they do that data dump. And I think um, disregarding the goals of the patient in 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 that initial conversation really sets up the patient to to disregard their own goals. A lot of times they'll feel like I, you know the message that they they receive is is even if it's it's implied is that you know I I won't be able to do those things anymore. And I think when you ask them what would you like to do and you give them the opportunity to tell you, I mean, they may not be grandiose, like, like you said, they may not be, um, you know, I wanna take this, you know, life altering trip, or it may be something as simple as, I wanna see my son graduate, I wanna see my grandson graduate, you know, I'd like to be able to, you know, to work part-time. It doesn't have to be something grandiose or, or, or really major, it, it could be something very small, but it's important to understand that and, and know how we, if we understand those goals, then we can better help that patient, you know, with the treatment plan. And I, I'm, one of the things I always tell patients is that you always should always know what your next modality option is going to be too, because you never know what, what, what can change in life. And, and you always want to know what you're going to do next. Because if you know what you're going to do next, the decision is easy. Hey, Richard, I, I think that's, uh, you know, a great point there is this kind of contingency and uh, Lillian uh, put, posted in the chat here, you know, kind of a, a, a segue uh, to that question is, uh, you know, how concerned should we be about access, uh, home access issues um, in light of increased um, use? And, and I've kind of been hearing some, some word on the streets lately um, as far as, you know, certain logistics and, and uh, uh, supplies and things like this, but it's, it's kind of a similar case to, well, COVID, like how prepared were we for, for COVID? And we did it last year and how prepared are we this year, right? right. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're coming to the same point. So can you speak to that at all? Yeah, no, so how concerned should we be? I think like this is exactly why it's important to, to dispel some of those myths out there about buttonhole cannulation. 
I think buttonhole cannulation will will solve the issue about access issues, especially because I mean, majority of our patients have fistulas now. Like we said, 70% are fistulas. Now, if we can't do it, then it could be a concern. But I would say, you know, the risk the risk involved with with frequent cannulation in a graft versus versus what's in the risk are involved in putting a patient in center on three times a week. Yeah. I mean, you got to do the, the, like we did earlier, the the balance approach, the comparison is, is, is not even, even close, right? The benefits far outweigh the risk when you're talking about cannulation. Now there are some things that I would do. I would say, make sure you're doing routine um, access evaluations. You know, you have access centers, make use of them. I know um, with one of the groups I worked with, they required their patients to go to uh, have their access evaluated every six months. And if they had a graph that had um, a history of clotting, they would go in every quarter to have their access evaluated. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of preventative measures that can be taken. We have the tools to do it. We just don't utilize them all the time. Um, so I, I always say like, when it comes to that, it's, it's definite concern. I hear it a lot, even from nephrologists. And I would say, um, don't, they, don't let that be an excuse. Um, utilize the, the tools you and resources you have at your disposal, send them for evaluations, do the education, and everything will be fine. I, and I think I mixed up uh, Lillian's question. So yeah, it's a, an access, vascular access question, looks like. Um, I, I'll segue to my question as far as logistics and supplies and, right. and resources, you know, the access to care in, in general, you, you spoke to this a lot. Um, from the staffing equation, but from the other sides of things, is the industry prepared for, you know, for a flux? Um, yeah, no, yeah, and and I know we had this conversation a little bit the other day, just in our in our general conversation. And I think, um, you know, the one thing I can say from a product perspective, from where I come from, products are not the problem right now. I'm like, there's plenty of product out there. The challenges that we're running into is delivery. <laughs> Because that's that's our industry that's being hit the hardest right now is is couriers and drivers and warehouses and things of that nature, um, you know. And I think we're we're working on solutions to be creative in that sense. I've gotten to the point where I've even offered to go pick up supplies myself and drop them off. I have some colleagues that have done that in Sam's area, um, where they you know even a year ago when when Texas had that deep freeze, and a lot of patients on home hemo didn't have access to water to make their dialysate or in center units couldn't couldn't run dialysis treatments because they didn't have their water systems up and running. Um, you know, my company actually delivered um, premix solutions and, and, and they had cyclers in the, in the region where they were able to do dialysis without a water source. Um, so those are the type of things that we're able to be a little bit more flexible with, but in terms of like equipment and supplies are not the problem. It's training staff and, and delivery staff that we're running into those issues. But we're we're mitigating we're kind of mitigating those things. I know the providers on both the, both of the LDOs, the big providers, have um, processes in place right now to um, prioritize situations based on need and emergency, um, mm -hmm. and they're doing that. So all of those those issues, like if they have patients that want to go on, um, they're they're managing those internally, uh, making sure that the patients that that need the supplies the most are being prioritized, and that no one is going without. I know that there's a lot of phone calls that have to be made and emails that have to be sent. But at the end of the day, the patients are getting what they need and, and they're not being put at risk. So I haven't seen any patient yet that has had to be hospitalized or go into an in-center unit because they couldn't get what they needed. Um, it's all been pretty pretty well managed so far. Um, it's created a lot more work for some of us in the industry, um, but I'd do that work three times over if I had to, if it meant getting the patients what they need. So, so if I'm taking away that um, that the industry is is in resolution of this as we speak, and and we've seen a lot of medical services go to different routes of deliveries and and patient transport to the the lift medical model um, mm -hmm. to you know who knows if Amazon's going to be delivering supplies for for us soon, but, but um, you know I think there's a lot of created ways that um, we can we can address the logistics. Um, outside of the internal. And Emily is uh, speaking to a national shortage of concentrates um, as we speak, which um, yeah. may have an impact as well. well in, and, that, and that may be true in, in the in-center world, but in the home side, it's not. 
um, we have plenty. Um, and and uh, and 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 what what more reason to send patients home, right? I mean, if, if you're having a shortage of, of, of concentrate in the in center world, um, let's let's send our patients home, and they can make their own concentrate at home, um, right. or their own their own their own dialysate at home, because that's exactly what we do. You know, we we send them home with with concentrate solutions in their bags, they can connect to their own water supply and make their own dialysate right there in their own home. So I, I think that's that's what the home, home hemo model can do in, in terms of helping with some of this. I think what we need to do, and this is just like conversation I like you and I, Mike, have had, and I'll share the my point that I made to you the other day is like, you know, and I look at the in-center world and we have, there, there's always complaints of not having enough space for patients to get trained to go home and, and you know, alleviate some of this stress we have on our system. Um, I think what what my point is is that when COVID hit, we we had no problem. Uh, I mean, we we were able to do it. Find you know extra chairs to isolate patients in the COVID cohort clinic. Mm -hmm. But when we were talking about training patients to go home or to do self care, um, there's yeah, never enough space. Yeah. And so uh, there's some contradictory. It's a contradiction in that. And and I and I always kind of point that out because it's like if you can find space to put a, a patient in isolation for COVID. Why can't we find space to put a patient in self-care training? And yeah, Richard, to your point, I mean, my my feeling is, you know, if you don't have if you don't have room in one center, it might be that your next center, you know, two miles down the road may have that. So I think that sometimes as clinicians, we we tend to put more barriers into into it and not really come up with solutions. Yeah. Um, the you know are innovative so I would say I would say to that because I've been a provider for a long time is uh, you know let's okay don't say we can't do it let's figure out how we can do it how to make it happen I agree with you 100 percent and and you know I, I, I like to ruffle feathers in those kind of conversations as Mike knows so I'll poke the bear every time yeah. <laughs> on something like that. <laughs> okay, everybody, we're at seven minutes past. I, I can tell that everybody's engaged and love this conversation. And I think it's a, you know, we've got the start of our community here in 2022. Spread the word about events and, and get your colleagues on these calls with us so that we can really have meaningful dialogue and take things out across the country um, in an evangelistic manner. Um, I want to thank Deneen uh, for putting together all the, the slides and, and uh, you know, un, under Richard's direction and guidance, but uh, kind of getting everything in order and for um, uh, organizing the Zoom meetings and, and she'll, you'll be hearing from her as far as the follow-ups and, and next steps, folks. So look forward to seeing you all next month. Have a great rest of your week. Great job, Richard. Thank you, Thanks. Mike. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. All right, take care, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>